So my name is Elena. I am here with the SDM Foundation. That's the Stuart D. McIntosh Foundation. Um, we are here to make tech easy for everyone. We offer individual appointments. They are all totally free um, and no question is too small. So we are here today to talk about security and privacy. If we break those two words apart, security is about keeping your information safe. And privacy is choosing what information we want to share with websites, with companies, or with the general public. Um, so we're going to go through examples of security and privacy through a lot of facets of how you interact with devices and the internet. The first and most golden rule, which might not be the most convenient, is you want to keep your device up to date. Why do we want to do this? Because updates contain bug fixes, which means if there's problems with functionality, software gets updated all the time to fix those. But more importantly, they contain security updates. So if somebody finds a vulnerability in a piece of software, part of those constant software updates include fixes to vulnerabilities that you know make you less secure. So the more updated your device is, the better. Sometimes a, a feature, a function is changed and you didn't ask for it and you don't like it <laughs> the way that the developers made it. But unfortunately, in order to be the most up to date with security, we have to take the all the feature updates as well. Um, there are ways to do automatic updates. We can check in our device if the... Uh, the updates are running automatically or whether we have to check them periodically. Specifically for Windows machines, sometimes they have these optional updates and really you want to be running those too. So usually at SDM, if someone comes in in an app or a device is not behaving like we expect it to, one of the first places we check is are all of the system updates run, like have all the system updates run Let's get it up to date. Let's restart the machine. And then let's see if we're still seeing the behavior that we don't expect. A note about antivirus software. You do need antivirus on a Windows machine. Currently, if you get a new Windows machine, there's a program called Microsoft Defender. It comes included for free. There are other antivirus softwares like McAfee and others that you may have heard of that are, some are available for purchase, some do different things. At SDM, we don't tend to recommend a particular antivirus. We do have some blog posts about it. Um, so anybody's welcome to check out our blog. Um, but in general, you just need to make sure you have an antivirus. And more importantly, you need to have only one <laughs> antivirus. An antivirus itself is a very intrusive piece of software. So if an antivirus sees another antivirus, they tend to fight each other. Uh, so you just wanna make sure you only have one running at a time. Other devices like phones and Macs, they tend to be, they, they are just less vulnerable to viruses. So while there may exist antivirus software technically for phones and Macs in general, the best practice you, is not to have an antiviral software and to just keep the devices updated. The next section is on passwords, which is which is a hot button. <laughs> um, so first, what is a password? Why do we need them? We need to verify that we are who we say we are. So let's say I go to amazon.com and I say, hi, Amazon. I want to know what I ordered last month so I can order it again. And Amazon goes, whoa, whoa, whoa. I'm not going to tell you that information unless you prove that you're Elena. And I say, no, it's me. I promise. Here's a password as evidence that it's me. And Amazon checks it out and says, okay, I believe you are who you say you are. Here's your order history so that you can place another order. Each password for each website and for each use case should be both unique and hard to guess. And you may be thinking that's impossible because I have dozens, maybe even hundreds of logins. How are they supposed to be complex enough and unique 
across all of these. I can never remember those. And that is okay. In fact, we are at the stage in our relationship with technology that nobody should be remembering their passwords. We're going to talk about ways to manage your passwords in a little bit, but you can just let go of that expectation for yourself if you ever had it. Let's not expect to remember passwords nowadays. What is a strong password? You may see these rules pop up on websites that it's you're trying to make a new password and they have all these criteria for you. The reason that they do this is that there are, unfortunately, people with malicious software that can just keep guessing passwords, guessing, 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 and they can use software. They don't have to do it by hand. If you have a complex password that is over eight characters long, includes uppercase letters, includes lowercase letters, includes numbers, it gets exponentially harder for an algorithm to guess a password. There are also password alternatives. You may already be unlocking your phone by letting it look at your face or read your fingerprint. That's called biometric. There's also consolidated logins. So some sites say you can make your own username and password, or you can log in with Google, or you can log in with Facebook, which can be very convenient because that's one fewer password to create. It does put a little bit more risk on the one Facebook password, and it does allow Facebook or whoever to know about your activity on those sites that you're reusing the password for. In the most extreme case, there are things called authenticator apps or even physical tokens that generate a random number once a minute, and that's how some people log in. So you have unique strong passwords. How are you going to keep track of them? Nothing is foolproof, totally, but the best thing is what works best for you. So some people use a physical address book and under the letter A, they have their Amazon password. Under the letter C, they have their Comcast password and they just carry that book with them at all times. Uh, some people have a document or a note maybe on their phone. You can even have a locked note on your phone that lists your passwords. You can use your browser to manage them or you can use a password manager. Let's say I'm a person who's very disorganized and I lose things all the time. So a physical address book, that's, a, that's not a good option for me. I use a password manager. Two-factor authentication. This means your password is only half of your authentication. So you're gonna type in your username and password, and then it's going to do something else. It's gonna send a code to your cell phone or to your email. So that means just having the password is not the only way to get in. Like you have to both have the password and receive a text with a one-time code. Um, so that's also a best practice nowadays. It's still possible to forget a password or to reset your password. We can do it all the time. If you forget a password and then you don't have access to the account where you could reset your password, then you might be a little bit stuck. You might be stuck calling the company and trying to prove who you are because they don't have those, those metrics anymore of, well, we know that you knew a password and we know that you had access to this email. Check in on your important accounts and see what the recovery methods are and make sure they're still current. Um, recovery methods can include, they said a, a cell phone number, a phone number, an email, sometimes security questions. They make you set up weird questions like, what city did you get your first car in? <laughs> or like, what's your mother's maiden name? Um, those are recovery questions. Sometimes biometric data will do it, that if you can, you know, biometric face or, or fingerprint in, back into your phone, then you can recover things. Or another device that is logged in there, how do people get passwords in general? Usually someone is not getting them from your password manager. But more often when people are getting passwords or hacking in, it's because it's not because our password manager is hacked. It's because the company is hacked or someone in your home gets them or, or someone executes a scam or a fish. 
to get them. And we'll talk more about that um, in a second. So just to review, to stay safe with passwords, each password should be strong. So follow some, some rules to make them a little complex. They should be unique for each site. Use two-factor authentication when it's available. And if you are going to start resetting passwords, prioritize accounts with sensitive information, like a medical account, like a financial account. Let's say some minor site that you bought something from once a year ago gets hacked. It's really easy for someone to take a username and a password and then just try it again on other sites. And if that one-time purchase is the reason that someone can get into your bank information, like that's no good. So start with the important ones to make sure those are strong and unique and then go from there. Okay, the next section is on internet safety and browsing. When we look at a URL that is a link, essentially an address to get you to a website, you see it in the form of HTTP or HTTPS colon slash slash www.example.com. What is in between the last dots is the actual domain. So for example, if you see something like Experian.com is that website where like you might do identity tracking. If you see offers.experian.com or account.experian.com, that's still Experian.com. But if you see totallyexperian.com with no extra dots, that's a different website. Another note is that the S, HTTPS, means encrypted browsing. It means secure browsing. That's a good thing. That means that when data is being sent from your browser back to some server or back to the hub of the website, that it's being sort of garbled and encrypted before it's sent out, which is a good thing that if you're logging in and it has to, that means it has to like encrypt your password before it sends it back instead of just sending a plain text version of what you're typing. It is possible to click malicious links in many places in emails. Like if you don't know the link, don't click it. A lot of things come from ads in Facebook or ads in Google. You might see strange ads on the side of a website because some of those could take you to malicious websites. I have a quick demo. This is a quiz. It's called a phishing quiz. And it lets you practice looking at URLs to see if they're suspicious. And so let's say I got this email from Luke Johnson sharing a department budget document. The thing that I want people to notice, and it's very subtle, but when I hover over a link, there's a gray box in the bottom left corner. So if I hover over this link, what I see is a gray box. And in the gray box, it says HTTP colon slash slash. So I notice that there's no S. That makes me a little suspicious drive-google.com. I know Google has Google Drive, which is drive.google.com, but this is drive-google.com. That's not actually Google. So I'm going to say that this is a phishing attack, not legitimate. And they say, correct. This is a phishing email. You must have spotted the lookalike URL. So Mousing over a link for, or using a long press will show that it goes to an insecure imitation domain. Let's try another one. You've received a fax. So I get an email from no reply at efax.com, E-F-A-C-K-S.com, which is spelled incorrectly. So I'm a little suspicious. And then it says, click here to view this fax online. When I hover over the link, HTTP colon slash slash, again, no S, I don't like it, efax.hosting.com dot 
mailru382.co. The actual domain is mailru382.co, but they put a .com in front of it to try and trick me. So I'm going to say that this is phishing. So the first clue was the misspelled efax.com, who I don't recognize. I wasn't expecting a fax today. And then the link is actually mailru382.co. It would be really easy for me to get tricked by that if I didn't read the whole URL. So really slowing down and giving things another look, especially if you're not expecting something, is a good way to take a step back and say like, is this what I think it is? And and save yourself, you know, a pain later. Something to point out before I go back into slideshow view, up here, there is a lock. So this is, this website is HTTPS colon slash slash docs.google.com. And this little lock symbol means that it is a secure site. It's an HTTPS site and it's, information is being encrypted, which is great. Okay, another hot button topic, cookies. <laughs> Everyone's favorite thing to hate right now. <laughs> um, so cookies, despite their delicious name, um, they're the name that refers to small pieces of data stored on your local computer. You might have preferences about your website. You may have different ways that you interact with a website. And the, the website doesn't want to have to learn that information over and over again. So it makes a cookie and it can store it in the local storage of your actual browser. So it's not storing it back wherever the website's coming from. It's in your browser. Cookies are not necessarily a good or bad thing. They're actually just kind of neutral pieces of information. And <clears throat> some of them are for different purposes. You may notice basically every website you go to right now has this pop-up that's like, what are your cookie preferences? This is because the EU has legislation. It is it is a law enacted that there has to, every website has to be, have a way to transparently allow a user to opt in or out of these different cookies. And so if any website operates in the EU, that has to, it has to have it. Cookies that are useful and kind of necessary for the website, a lot of times it remembers your login information. It will garble it up, it'll encrypt it. So it's not like it's storing your password plain in the browser, but it will store a token that lets you remain logged in, which is really convenient, right? That sometimes you open a browser and you go to Facebook and you're still logged in from the last time and you didn't have to retype in your password. That's actually a convenient feature and that's because of cookies. And then the next time you go to the website, the website doesn't have to ask because that storage in your browser remains persistent over multiple times you open your browser. Where it gets a little dicey and where people might wanna do finer control is tracking cookies. So that sort of creepiness that follows you across the internet of, I looked at this website once and now I'm getting ads for it in every other site. There are cookies that save information about what you click, what you look at, and other websites can use that information. And so sometimes websites will even sell information about your interactions to other advertisers. So when you go in to look at your cookie preferences, there's always necessary cookies that are necessary for the website to function, but there are usually ad cookies too. And these are the types that you can opt out of. And so some people want more finer control over. Some people, I do know some people who like having targeted ads <laughs> that if they, if you turn off all your, you know, ad tracking over, over your experience, you're still going to get pushed advertisement, but it's going to be for like something that you don't care about, right? You're, I'm going to get advertised a fishing boat or something that I, that I don't care about as opposed to like the shoes that I looked at last week. It's a, it's a personal preference and it's a privacy thing. How much of your data do you care 
that websites are getting access to and sharing. Phishing, spam, and scams. <laughs> so let's just define these three terms separately. Spam is not necessarily malicious. It's mostly annoying, right? Mm -hmm. If you're getting bombarded with advertisement emails all the time, the advertisement could take you to a legitimate store where you could buy something and no, you know, they're not going to steal your data, but it's annoying. And it's a, it's just a bother <laughs> to your everyday scams are trying to trick you to do something. Mm -hmm. So give me $200 and I'll send you 2000 later mm -hmm. is a usually trying to get you to, to take an action, usually to steal money. Phishing was spelled with a PH is trying to get information from you. And this is where people and websites pretend to be a trusted source so that you will give your information over that they can then use to access websites and data. So a few general rules. No organization will ever ask you for your actual password. Even a website that where you type in your username and password that website, like they're not actually storing your password. They might be storing some encrypted version of it, but they never actually want to know what your password is. So if someone is asking you to say your password out loud over the phone, nope, never. They will never actually ask you. Speaking of phone calls, large organizations, Microsoft, Apple, Google, the IRS will very rarely, if ever, usually never, they will never call you. So if someone's saying that I'm from Microsoft, I'm calling because you have a virus, they don't actually have the time and resources to call individual users. So that's a red flag right there. The wording of phishing, spam, and scam, well, phishing and scams is designed to scare you and to make you act quickly before you have time to think about what's happening. So one example, is the common computer support scam. Maybe this comes from an ad that got clicked wherever it comes from. Your computer might even make a noise, it might make a beep, and a scary message that pops up that says, don't shut down, yeah. your computer's at risk, you have a virus. Maybe there's a number to call, maybe there's a link to click. What we're gonna do is the opposite of what it says. We're not gonna call, we're not gonna click, we're going to shut the computer down. <laughs> there, there is usually nothing that is actually that time sensitive that requires you to like keep your computer on, act now. Usually nothing falls that into that category. The thing that we want to do, you're not sure, you're seeing something scary, something's popping up, just shut the machine down. Great. Just make sure when you turn it back on, you don't open the same windows because there might be... <laughs> one of your old browser tabs that had this in it. So just let's not open the same internet pages when we get back on the computer. I want to illustrate how some of these can go, how some of these scams can, can play out because you might be thinking like, how does anybody ever get to the point that they lose money, right? How does anybody just like give money away to somebody? Here is like one example of a logical progression of events. One of these, you know, messages pops up. You have a virus. Don't shut down. Call this number. So you call the number and somebody says, I'm with tech support. I need you to follow these instructions mm -hmm. and download a program so that I can look at your computer. So you download a program. You type in what they say. They get access to your mouse and your desktop. They click around. And they say, oh, yes, we found a virus. No, they didn't. <laughs> we need you. We need to do our next level of tech support. Can we have your credit card number? You're sitting here panicking. Okay, yes, there's a, you, you found a virus. Let's do this. So now you're, they're starting to build trust with you, right? These are the tech support people. They're looking at my machine. You give your credit card number. They say they're going to charge a hundred dollars to, and I and I say this verbatim because this happened to my grandmother. 
they're going to charge $100 to fix your machine. And then the credit card company calls her and says, hey, you just got a charge for $99 from China. And she says, no, that's okay. Let it through. It's the tech support people. Because once you're in it, you're like, no, these people, you know, these people are trying to fix. I don't, I don't have another option. They said they have to do it right now. So when you're getting, you know, it's, it is very easy to get caught up in the moment. And it starts with a very scary message that says you have to act now. And so part of it is realizing you always have a moment to take a breath. You can always get a second opinion. It doesn't have to be that exact person on the phone with you. This is not just computer hacking. It's social hacking, right? It's psychologically trying to get somebody to just click a button, accept a charge, and make a mistake very quickly. Email and text safety. I think we covered a lot of this by looking at that phishing test that I talked about. But when you see an email and you're not sure you know, who is the email from? Do you know the sender? Where does that link go? Again, hover over the link and see in the bottom left what the link actually is. Are there any attachments? Don't download the attachments if you don't know exactly who it's from and exactly what it is. Just in general, be skeptical. If it's a friend behaving erratically over email, call them up and <laughs> ask them if they, <laughs> if they meant to send you that PDF. Uh, uh, also over text message. Again, do you know who it's from? Is their number saved in your phone? Don't click on any links that you don't know about. Don't even respond. That's one. Don't even respond to say, boo, I know you're a spammer. Get out of here. Because <laughs> they will know that you responded and they'll say, oh, good. We know that there's a live person at the end of this number because they're just blasting messages out to a whole bunch of numbers. So if you respond to it, they're like, great, that's a real person's number. We're going to try them again later. An example for text specifically, where like phishing is spelled with a PH, but text over SMS is called smishing apparently. <laughs> um, but there's a lot of these, your package is unavailable. The USPS is texting you. USPrenewal.com is not the USPS. USP daxkb.com is not the USPS. And you like, they will probably not text you <laughs> for this sort of thing. But if you give it a quick read, right, you're like, oh, I was expecting a package, which a lot of people are nowadays, and it's temporarily unavailable. You don't have to resolve that over text message. You can always pause, be skeptical, and say, well, I'm expecting a package from Amazon. So I'm going to go check my Amazon account and log in with my password and check on that package. I'm not going to follow this text. There is always a second opinion. There's always a, a way to check on things besides clicking on a link that you're not sure about. So these last few slides is basically touching on the overarching theme of security and privacy, which is that we are constantly trading data for convenience. So the more data we supply, the more convenient and the, the more curated of an experience we can get with a website, with applications, with machines. But we just have to be aware of and more intentional with those choices, that there's no, no bad choice, there's no wrong choice. If it were up to the companies collecting this data, they would just be you know collecting it all the time. No one would really make a choice. It would just sort of be this passive yeah, sure, you can have my data, I guess. I don't really understand it. But things like this legislation in Europe about cookies, it's like, no, we want to give people the, the power of choice and the power of knowledge to be making intentional choices about this stuff. At SDM, you know, if you ever get into a situation that you have questions about things, then give us a call, give us an email, set, us up, set up an appointment. Um, this is what we what we love to do. So thank you.